Welcome to uh, today's seminar. It will be Aaron Kettner talking about Kuntz Pimsner algebras of twisted partial Z actions. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you. Um, I will talk about my PhD project supervised by Karen. Um, I gave um, a slightly similar talk like a year ago at the Easter day, maybe someone remembers. And I gave the exact same talk um, in November at the fields, but I guess only Karen was there. Um, Okay, so if we take a classifiable system algebra, so a sister algebra that is uh, unital, infinite, simple, separable, nuclear, as is stable, and satisfies the UCT, then um, we have two options. Either the sister algebra is stably finite. Um, that is, if the tracial state space is non-empty, if we have traces, um, or it will be purely infinite. If we don't have traces. Now I should say that uh, having or not having traces is not the definition of being purely infinite or stably finite in general, but for classifiable sister algebras, it's the same thing. Um, now let's say this blob represents stably finite sister algebras and this blob represents um, purely infinite sister algebras. Then in here, we, for example, have AF algebras or we have the Jinsu algebra. In here, we have the Kunz algebras. O2, O3, up to O infinity. Now, a very natural question is, um, how can we construct examples of classifiable sister algebras? How can we get our hands on them? Now, of course, there's a lot of different ways to construct uh, sister algebras, but I will focus on dynamical constructions. And in particular, um, actions of the integers on topological spaces. So let's take a compact infinite, Um, second countable metrizable space. With finite covering dimension. And let alpha be a minimal homeomorphism. Minimal meaning, of course, that there are no closed invariant subsets. Now, uh, given this, we can form a Z action by taking powers, right? Um, and then we can form the cross product sister algebra. And under these assumptions, this cross product will be classifiable. Um, yeah, so these are standing assumptions. So whenever I write X, I mean such a space, and whenever I write alpha, I mean such a minimal homeomorphism. Um, by the way, interrupt me at any time if I should make anything more clear. Um, yeah, so these uh, cross products will be somewhere in this picture. Now, first of all, they will always be stably finite because they always have traces. The trace on the cross, cross product corresponds to an invariant measure on the space X, and those always exist. Um, and secondly, um, notice that I that this circle is disjoint from this circle of AF algebras, and it also does not include the Jexu algebra. And the reason for that is the next theorem. from a paper of Robin Dealey, Ian Putnam, and Karen. 
um, from 2020. Let X have uh, finitely generated K theory. And let alpha be minimal. Um, then there exists a natural number D and uh, finite abelian groups. F0 and F1, such that the K theory, the cross product uh, is, uh, so KJ is isomorphic to Z to the D, direct sum FJ for J in zero one. Um, I should say that for me, the natural numbers do not include zero. So you need to, th there's always going to be at least one copy of Z in both K1 and K0 here, which tells us that indeed, uh, neither F algebras nor the Jenks algebra will be contained in here because they both have vanishing K1. So that's not possible here. Okay. So this, oh, right, that's something I forgot, the converse direction. Um, or any natural number and any finite abelian groups there exists x and alpha such that this holds so that such that the k theory is of this form can can I ask about what goes into this? Is it much more than the Pemtavoikolasko sequence? Or um, no, I think that's uh, yeah. I mean, you need to somehow construct this uh, like in in this direction. You need to somehow construct the space and the homeomorphism. And I think this is done using these point like spaces, right? Right. But, but the, the, the restriction, the K theory, has to be of like the the run K zero that you want to. I think so, yeah, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, somehow in the, it's a good question. I mean, somewhere in the proof, they say that uh, K1 of the cross product has to contain a copy of Z, and I still don't understand why, but uh, somehow this this plus the Pimps and sequence. Is, uh... Yes, please explain that to me in detail. That's okay. I, I that's... still don't understand like why re this... Uh, this is true, but uh, okay. um, right. So this theorem tells us that there are a lot of interesting C-star algebras which we cannot um, cannot realize in this way, which is sad, I guess, since these C-star algebras are nice and super well understood, but yeah, it doesn't give you everything. So yeah, how can we do better? How can we uh, construct? more classifiable C-star algebras, while at the same time not making the construction horribly more complicated. Um, now what we will look at are partial actions, as is already in the title. Okay, so definition, let U and V. Sorry, yes. Just a no. slightly off topic question. Um, before you start on that. Uh, so I noticed there's nothing here about the, the tracial state spaces. Um, but knowing now, for example, it's like, you know, Dominic Fetniak has the results by getting any simplex has measures on the, for actions on the sphere. Can you use this to? to... Um, we can not out of the box, but we can probably adapt. Did this proof it actually appear? Not yet, but when I spoke to him, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. in the works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you go Okay, Thanks. sorry, please. No, no problem. Um, yeah, so take two open subsets. 
of the space, then a partial automorphism is simply a homeomorphism between these two open subsets. So the picture is the following. We have the, the space X, and then we pick two open subsets, U and V, and we want theta to map from U to V. That's, that's it. Um, and just like we can obtain an integer action from a homeomorphism by taking its powers, we can obtain a partial z-action from, from this. Obtain a partial z-action by taking powers. Uh, theta to the n. Right, so that's an action, so mapping from Z to uh, homeomorphisms on X, and N gets mapped to theta to the N. Now, of course, there's a slight issue here now because this is not, theta is not a homeomorphism on all of X anymore. Um, so we run into problems when we try to, to iterate it. Okay, so for example, this point here, it gets mapped into V by theta. But it doesn't, th this image does not lie in U anymore. So we cannot apply theta again, which means that we cannot apply theta squared to the point we started with. Um, so we have to take care of the domains. Each of these powers will have its own domain that is smaller than the domain we started with. Because what we want is we want only to take points that uh, get mapped into U again, so that get mapped into the intersection of u and v, and then we can apply theta again. OK, so I'm... Hmm? Uh, you usually uh, require that they are the biggest possible, which means that they are in a... OK, so let me just write this down. So the domains, uh, which we call dn, so the nth domain, Wait, let me, I'm not sure if I can actually get this right. In the, so let's, like the, the okay, sorry. So we would usually want theta to the n to map from d minus n to d plus n. That's the convention. Um, so that means u is d1, uh, d minus one, sorry, v is d1. And then, for example, d minus two, which is the maximal domain of theta squared, would be, the pre-image of the intersection, right? Because those are all of the points where I can, I apply uh, theta once, I land in the intersection and I can apply theta again. Um, and the same formula holds for, uh, for all the others. I think dn is equal to theta to the minus n of, now oh, I might get this wrong, the, uh, n intersected with u or something like there's a formula and you usually require yeah to take the the biggest possible domains so a good question thanks okay um this might be wrong though i'm not sure all uh, right and now there's a way given such a partial z action to form the partial cross product Now, I'm not going to define this now, um, this partial cross product. I will later outline a more general uh, construction that includes this as a special case. Okay, but somehow you can get a C0 algebra out of this in a way that is similar to the usual cross product construction. Okay. Um, right. 
Now, the next natural question is, are these sister algebras classifiable? Are these partial cross products classifiable? And that's what the next theorem tells us. Shirley Geffen. That's uh, theta b minimal. And the covering dimension of the space be finite. So minimality for a partial automorphism means basically the same thing that you don't have the closed invariant subsets. Um, then the partial cross product. Which again, at this point, is just some mysterious sister algebra I haven't defined. But uh, yeah, again, it's, uh, I'll, I'll do that later. Um, this is classified. Okay, so that means that these partial cross products are somewhere in this picture. And now the question is where? What's the, the range of the Elliott invariant? That's the content of another theorem from the same paper of Robin and Ian Putnam and Karen. If G0 and G1 are countable abelian groups, and delta is a Schoki simplex. that has finitely many extreme points. Um, then there exists a space and a closed subset and a minimal homeomorphism such that, now I realize I forgot something. Um, okay, uh, sorry, give me one second. I forgot one example. That's very important. Uh, go over here. So I wanted to give an example of a partial automorphism, the most important example for us in this talk, which is you take a global homeomorphism so in case you haven't noticed yet, alpha always global homeomorphism, theta always a partial uh, thing. You take a global homeomorphism and a closed subset y of x, and you just restrict the domain of alpha to the complement of y. So you take, take y out of the domain. You define theta from x minus y to alpha of x minus y to just map x to alpha of x. So we have our space. And now we have, uh, so y is the thing outside. And here we have uh, x minus y. Let's get mapped somewhere to alpha of x minus y. And this is what, what theta should be. So on this space, theta should just be should just be alpha. We're just restricting the domain. Um, yeah, sorry, back to back to this. Um, because now this partial automorphism that we have in this theorem is exactly of this form. We take, uh, so there exists a space X, a closed subset Y, and a homeomorphism such that um, minimal one such that a naught of A, where we want to call A, A is the partial cross product with respect to alpha restricted to 
x minus y. This is isomorphic to z plus g naught. And k1 of this is isomorphic to g1. And the tracial state space. So now we also make a statement about the tracial state space. This delta. So in k k0, you still have this copy of z that you can't get rid of. But in k1, you have the prescribed group. And then the tracial state space is this, this showcase simplex that is arbitrary except for having finitely many extreme points. So this tells us something about the range of the Elliot invariant for these partial automorphisms, partial cross products. You said the earlier question. Uh, the same thing about the tracial state space would be true in the other theorem. We can always get it. Yeah. Except the tracial state space. Thanks. So um, to update this picture, now we have in here partial cross products. Um, I never know with the cross products if the thing should be open to the left or to the right. I feel like I'm, that's the one. Okay. Then the I, other okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm I'm not now it includes AF algebras and it includes the Jackson algebra. I draw the line dotted because up to my knowledge there's no definite resu result on the range of these things. So they might be everything. But they but you be. you I mean okay, you put it in the stably finite side though. So oh, is it right. obvious that they are? Thank you. Finite? That's a great comment. Um it's not obvious I guess, but again, um as for the usual cross products Tracial states correspond to invariant measures. And as for global actions, you can show that uh, you always have an invariant measure. Because yeah. that is an amenable that is an amenable group. So that's not, that's not so obvious. Not it's it's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we can no, but like I can we can talk about it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's something you need to show, but it's been shown. So, yeah. Basically the proof that like, the classical proof for the existence of an invariant measure still works. More or less the same. I feel like I even ask you this a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, um, as Bishan pointed out, we are still only in the stably finite setting. So, how do we get to the purely infinite uh, setting? How do we construct purely infinite Seastar algebras? Maybe I should erase something or I just, go, just erase this example. This uh, for cleaning the board, or oh, okay, yeah. What about the purely infinite case? Now I should say that of course um, there are a lot of different ways to construct purely infinite Seastar algebras, for example from graphs. In fact, uh, Katsura has shown that um, every classifiable purely infinite Seastar algebra can be realized from uh, as a topological graph Seastar algebra, but we want a dynamical construction. So for us, the trick is to add extra data, and the extra data that we add is a vector bundle. So Again, take a partial automorphism. On X. And now take a vector bundle over the domain of the partial automorphism over U. This should be a rank N vector bundle. A uh, quick reminder on what a vector bundle is. A vector bundle consists of the total space E, the base space, in our case U, the domain of the partial automorphism, um, and a continuous surjective map P, the bundle projection, such that um, 
the fiber over every point in U is homeomorphic to C to the N. So we can put a vector space structure on the fibers. And uh, we want this to be locally trivial. So for all X in U, there exists an open set, an open neighborhood of X, such that the vector bundle restricted to U, which is just the same as P inverse of W. So all the all the fibers over over the open set W. This should be isomorphic to the trivial bundle W times C to the N. Where here by isomorphism, that's important. Isomorphism means an isomorphism of vector bundles. So preserving the base space. If I if I'm uh, in some fiber over some point on this side, and then I go to the other side, I'm still going to be in this in the fiber over the same point. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, so that's number one, base preserving, and the other thing is that it should induce a linear map on the fibers. Okay. Um, right. So the picture is we have again our space, and we have the open subset U, and then we have these with the vector bundle over U, which consists of which attaches a vector space to each point in U. Okay. Um, one more thing we need are sections. These are continuous maps from the base space into the total space, which are right inverses to the bundle projection. So P composed with S should be the identity on U. Um, now, given this vector bundle, we can look at the space of all continuous sections of the vector bundle. Okay, so this should be the space of continuous sections of E vanishing at infinity. since U is, is open. Um, and this is a right Hilbert C of X module. Now, um, a Hilbert module over some c star algebra is just, it's, it's basically a Hilbert space where you replace the comp complex numbers with the sister algebra. Um, so first of all, in our case, the sister algebra is C of X. First of all, um, it's a module, just in the algebraic sense. So there's a multiplication of continuous functions with sections. We take section and a continuous function. There's a way to multiply F to Xi from the right and get an, another section. And for us, this is just a uh, pointwise multiplication. Um, yeah, I mean, the section in each point of the base space, it gives you a vector. And a continuous function for each point of the base space, it gives you a, um, a complex number. So you can multiply the vector with the complex. It's just pointwise. Um, this is the multiplication. The other thing we need, because it's a Hilbert module, is an inner product. So that is a map from the product uh, gamma naught of E times gamma naught of E into C of X. So usually for Hilbert space, this would be C, but here it's C of X. Um, yeah, that fulfills the usual, that has the usual properties. Yeah, if you change the entries, you get the, the, the star. Um, it's usually assumed to be linear in the second component and anti-linear in the first component, and it's positive definite. Hmm? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I understand that might seem a little weird. Um, we could uh, regard it as a C zero of U module, but we can also regard it as a. So we want C of X as the coefficient algebra. Yeah, X is complex. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is that when you do these like local trivialization partition of unity things, you do work over U, so it doesn't really, at that point, it doesn't really help you that the space around is. I could have also assumed X to be just locally compact. It doesn't make such a difference. It's just, we will see in a moment that I want a C star correspondence over C of X in the end. Okay, one for the Kunz-Pimsner algebra stuff, you need a fixed, you need uh, the same algebra acting on the left and the right. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, yeah, that's why C of X and not C zero of U. Um, and this inner product for the these uh, vector bundles, it's basically also just point-wise. So that's a little imprecise. Um, but yeah, so it just means that we if we have uh, two sections, we want to compute this inner product, we just um, take the two vectors we get in the fiber over the point, and we compute the inner product there. Okay, this, this uh, requires us to choose inner products in the fibers in a continuous way. But yeah, you can show that that's always possible. Okay, so now we have a right Hilbert C of X module. Um, but this only um, this only uses the vector bundle, but we somehow want to incorporate the dynamics also, and this is done by defining a left action, which is just a, a star homomorphism from C of X into the adjointable linear operators. Um, so again, if you're not familiar with Hilbert module theory, then that might seem a little strange. Um, but basically, for Hilbert spaces, um, every bounded operator has an adjoint, right? That's the basic theorem. Now, it's not true anymore for Hilbert modules. For Hilbert modules, you need to restrict to the space of operators which do have an adjoint. Okay, so this should be a star homomorphism. And how is it defined? It's defined... Uh, by taking a continuous function and the operator that corresponds to this continuous function, if this acts on a section, then it acts by right multiplication with F composed with theta. Okay, so this is just the right multiplication that we, we had here point-wise, but we, um, we twist this by the, by the theta. Now we have a right Hilbert module with a left action um, that gives us a C star correspondence. If you don't know what a C star correspondence is, it's exactly this. Okay, it's just like, if you don't know what it is, forget the word. It's just a right Hilbert module where you have this kind of operator. Or this kind of star homomorphism. Um, yeah, so we obtain a C star correspondence over C of X, which we generally denote by E, curly E, and we can take its von Pimsen algebra.
OE. Um, a Kunz-Pimson algebra is, uh, is a sister algebra associated to a sister correspondence. There's uh, like a general way of constructing a, a sister algebra, uh, yeah, sister algebra out of a given sister correspondence. And uh, Marzi, that's why um, we have to take C of X because for the Kunz-Pimson algebra stuff, you need the same sister algebra acting from the left and from the right. Um, yeah. Oh, right. Yes, makes it unital. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a question in the chat saying, what is L gamma zero of E? Ah, oh, maybe that is uh, not visible in the. So, gamma zero of E is the right Hilbert module of continuous sections of the vector bundle. And then L of this Hilbert module are the adjointable linear operators, this Hilbert module. Um, OK, so right, I wanted to briefly say something about the Kunz-Pimsner algebra. Maybe I should finally erase some stuff. So uh, this Kunz-Pimsner algebra is um, sort of the universal sister algebra. Generated by C of X. And E, curly E, where curly E is our sister correspondence. Um, but with certain relations. For example, um, if we take a section Xi in the kunz pimson algebra, we take the star and we multiply it with another section again, in the kunz pimson algebra, then this should be the inner product of Xi and Eta. Okay, um, maybe that's a bit mysterious. That's why we have some examples. Um, if we take our partial automorphism theta to just be a global homeomorphism alpha and we take E to be the trivial line bundle over X, so just X times C, then this space of continuous sections will be just C of X, right? I'm just for each point in X, I'm choosing uh, a complex number in a continuous way. So I just get C of X. And um, the kunz pimsner algebra will just be the cross product. Wait, sorry, which <laughs> this? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yes. Why? Well, the cross product can be thought of as the C star algebra generated by C of X and the unitary, right? With the relation that F times U should be U times F composed with alpha. That's what the cross product is. And now we see that this commutation relation is exactly 
how we define the left action here. So that, that's where that is coming from. Um, and we only need to consider one unitary instead of the space of all sections because our space of sections is just C of X. So it's enough to look at the constant section that's one everywhere and then up to right multiplication by continuous functions that gives us everything. So yeah, this constant section that's one everywhere will be our unitary. And it's a unitary because of these certain relations. You put, uh, for example, this one, you can see that it's an isometry because yeah, U star U is, uh, is the identity. Yeah, so that's why we get the cross product here. Um, now, if we change from the global to the partial setting, we take a partial automorphism, but we again take just the trivial line bundle over U. Then the Kunz-Pimson algebra will be exactly the partial cross product. Yeah, I haven't defined this yet. So if you like, you can take this as the definition. Um, yeah, that's what you what you get. And the last example, if the space is just a point, then of course the vector bundle has to be trivial. It's just going to be a point times c to the n, and then the uh, Kunz-Pimson algebra will be the Kunz algebra, O n. Um, again, why? The Kunz algebra is generated by O n, is generated by n isometries. Now our space of sections is just c to the n. So we can fully describe that by choosing an orthonormal basis. And this orthonormal basis will give us exactly these isometries. So that they have to be isometries, you can again see from this relation. Um, yeah, that again, the thing star times the thing needs to be one. And yeah, the other relations you can also, you can also show. So this gives you the concept. Um, this is very nice, these examples, because these examples show us that, first of all, um, all of our previous examples are included, both cross products um, by the integers and the partial cross products. They are both included in our new framework. But also, we can construct purely infinite things, for example, the Kunz algebras. So that's going into the right direction. I would say. Um, now again, the logical question is, under which general assumptions are these guys classifiable? Okay. So there's a theorem. Again, not by me, but by uh, seven people. Um, Maria Stella Adamo, Don, Don Archie, Marzi. Um, Magdalena Gescu, Ya A. Young, Karen, and uh, Maria Grazia Viola from 23, saying that alpha is minimal. So we are in the global setting, not the partial one. And um, we take a vector bundle. of rank n, then, um, and maybe I should again say that the covering dimension of the space is finite, just to make it clear, then the Kunz-Pimson algebra is classifiable. And moreover, the Kunz-Pimson algebra is stably finite.
if n equals one. So if we're talking about a line bundle and it is purely infinite, if n is greater than one. Now that fits very well, but with our examples for the line bundles, we got the uh, two kinds of cross products. Yeah. So they are stably finite. And for n greater than one, we got uh, the Puck-Kunz algebras, which uh, except for O1 are all purely infinite. And now comes uh, comes the theorem that I proved after 45 minutes of talking. I guess that's the longest introduction we, we ever had. Yes? Can you say the second thing again? Uh -huh. And we also have some other action along the fire um, so, so, so combine both of them. I'm not sure what you mean with the action on the fibers. Um, so, so. Uh, vector bundle, but it's uh, similar to fibers, so it just then points to the next thing, so it points to the next thing. Oh, do you mean this? No, right. Um, I'm not sure. So, so this, yeah, epsilon or curly E is uh, this incorpor this this uh, is this right Hilbert module we get from the sections of the vector bundle, plus um, this left action here, that that includes the that uses the theta. Lost two both points of your example. Uh huh. They're kind, they're kind of orthogonal to each other because one of them accounts for how theta acts on the polynomial space of the single and the double exponential construct of them. And the last both point when you when you have to just the point uh -huh. is the case when uh, again that's one's kind of very special. It acts on the on the on the only on the fire somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess you... Maybe, maybe, for example, epsilon is some kind of... Epsilon, so the, I think of correspondence of generic relation to bottom of right? Right, right. Yeah, so in this case, maybe uh, the last bullet point is an example of the bottom of Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the, the automorphism on the base space is certainly trivial, right? So because it's just, uh, the space is just a point. So in that sense, there's no dynamics here. But of course, you can still interpret a C-star correspondence as an action, uh, yeah, of, uh, as a map between C-star algebras, right? So in that, se that sense, yeah, we, we have, yeah, some kind of trivial, trivial action in, in that case. Okay. I, I think I know what you mean. As, did that answer the question? Or? Okay. Okay. So my theorem uh, just takes this theorem and generalizes it to the partial setting. Okay. So we just replace uh, theta. Or we we replace alpha with theta, and the rest stays the same. Minimal. Um, rank n. Again, the covering dimension of the space should be finite. Then um, let's just say the same conclusion sold. Okay, so the Kunz-Pimson algebra is classifiable and it's stably finite if and only if the vector bundle is a line bundle. Okay. Um, okay. So far, any questions? Um, yeah, it's basically the same. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the. <laughs> the transition, because the next thing I want to do in the, the last five to 10 minutes is uh, briefly talk about the proof, um, but not of 
everything because you need to check kind of a lot of things, right? But most of it, uh, yeah, it's not so hard. So, um, for example, nuclearity and the UCT just follow from general properties of uh, of Kunz-Pimpson algebras. Now, simplicity and um, and uh, this this last statement, which basically says something about the tracial state space, this is exactly as in their paper. The only thing that's a little different is the finite nuclear dimension. So instead of showing these showing z stability, I showed uh, finite nuclear dimension, and I maybe briefly wanna wanna outline how that works. Nuclear dimension. Now, um, this uses ideas from this paper of Shirley Geffen that I already mentioned earlier when it um, when I talked about classifiability of partial cross products and uh, Hirschberg Wu. So basically, wait, let me first uh, fix some notation. The orbit of a point, I guess everybody knows what that is. It's just all the points in the space that can be reached from that point using the action. So all points theta to the n of x, where n is in z. And now you need to take care of the domains. So you can only take those n such that x actually lies in the domain. So remember, d minus n was the domain of theta to the n. And uh, basically, what, um, what this paper from Shirley is doing is reducing to the case where all of the orbits of the action have a fixed size. Okay, so we assume that all of the orbits contain exactly M, capital M points, and no, um, no periodic orbits. So to draw one more picture, ah, now I don't have space again. Maybe this bits here. Um, we have the space, and now all orbits of the form you start somewhere. You take capital M many steps, and then you stop. Okay, and you always do exactly M steps, and you don't you don't close it. You don't go back to the starting point. You really just end there. Um, yeah. So we can re reduce to this to this case. Basically, that's what, what she does here uh, using inductive limit constructions and ex extensions it's to go from this case to the general case. Um, and then you can use, and now comes the idea from Hirschberg and Wu. This implies that the orbit space So the, the space X, but quotienting out orbit equivalents, where two points are equivalent if they're on the same orbit. This space is Hausdorff. Now I very quickly need to raise something. Or maybe let's just, no, let's just over there. Um, and furthermore, so the orbit space is Hausdorff, and the quotient map say pi is proper. 
proper means that free images of compact sets are compact. And that implies that um, I get um, an embedding And um, the image of, of this guy, so P star of C of X mod Z, these are exactly func all the functions uh, constant on, on theta orbits. Okay, so in particular, because of this um, this commutation relation with the action, this implies that this image is contained in the center of the Kunz-Wimson algebra. Okay, that's because uh, maybe it's still over there, but I can just, so F times Xi equals Xi of M F composed with theta, but if uh, F is constant along theta orbits, then it just the theta vanishes. So it, it commutes with everything. And that's, uh, that in turn implies that OE is a C of X mod Z algebra. So it, it fibers over the orbit space um, with fibers. So the fiber of OE at some, some orbit, some point in the orbit space, this is exactly the kunz pimsner algebra of the C-star correspondence restricted to this orbit. Um, and since our orbit has exactly M points and starts somewhere and ends somewhere, you can show that this guy has to be finite dimensional and it has to be simple. So that means it's just a matrix algebra. And now, very last thing, do I need to erase something again? Maybe, maybe over here. Um, yes, uh, good point. So you can restrict your C star correspondence to any invariant subset by restricting the vector bundle to the subset and restricting the action. And that's, yeah, that's it. So what this will be, because we have now uh, just M discrete points. So that, of course the vector bundle is trivial over these points, it's a discrete space. So you just get like copies of C to the N on each point attached to each point. And uh, yeah, this, this action just that just hops from one point to the other. That's what you will get, yes. And now, um, last, last thing, how does this help us? Now we know that our Kunz-Pimson algebra is a CFX algebra, so it fibers over the orbit space, and each fiber is just a matrix algebra. And now we can use a result from uh, Jose Carrion about the decomposition rank of CFX algebras that basically computes this, so the decomposition rank is related to the nuclear dimension, right? So if we are able to bound the decomposition rank, we also bound the nuclear dimension. Um, this expresses the decomposition rank in terms of the dimension of the underlying space and the decomposition ranks of all the fibers. So this is the inequality. This is the, it's less or equal than the covering dimension of the base space. For us, that's the orbit space plus one times the supremum over all X of the decomposition ranks of the fibers. Plus one and the whole thing minus one. And now this guy here, and I think there you need properness of the map, 
the quotient map. The, the covering dimension of the orbit space is uh, bounded by the covering dimension of the base space. The decomposition rank of the matrix algebra is zero. So what we're left if, uh, with is uh, dimension of x plus one. This whole bracket is just one, so it vanishes, and then minus one. So we are left with the covering dimension of x, okay, which means we bounded the decomposition rank of our Kutz-Pimson algebra by the covering dimension of the space. In particular, it's finite because we assume this to be finite. So the nuclear dimension is finite. And now you can use this whole thing from Shirley's paper about um, reducing to this case where you have uh, only orbits of a constant size. And that's how you show finite nuclear dimension. Um, OK, I think that's. Yes, the bound is still the same. I don't, it's a little. Ah, no. So the, it's a little more complicated. I don't remember now. There was some polynomial in the dimension of X. It's a little more complicated. No, uh, that's a good point. So the rank of the vector bundle doesn't play any role. It doesn't, uh, yeah, you don't see it. Yeah. And I guess, um, where does simplicity fall in to the picture? Because it's in the um, this. So reducing it to something unsimple. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. But then from are showing simplicity back in at the end? Or? Yes, so what you use on a technical level is that the, the partial automorphism is minimal. So you, you need that for this, this uh, yeah, basically reconstruction of the whole action just from points uh, from orbits with fixed size. So in this like, yeah, reconstruction thing or, or the other way around in this decomposition of the, the action into orbits of finite size, you use oh. that the action is minimal so that this, this so all works. If you're getting by allowing more and more points in these orbits and then taking that to infinity so you get something like Space, basically, yes. So you you have your space, x, and then you you have the domain, and you can exhaust the domain. So you take compact subsets of the domain. You can exhaust the domain by compact subsets that get bigger and bigger. And um, because the action is minimal, now if we restrict to each of these compact subsets, there you only have finite orbits because at some point you need to leave the compact subset. So that's how you restrict to the case that you have finite orbits, but of arbitrary size. And then you need to do some extension stuff in order to reduce to, uh, to, to de decompose this into the different parts with orbits of a fixed size. Yeah, it's actually an interesting point for, for global actions. You could just reduce to um, bounded orbits. So as long as the orbit size is uniformly bounded, you get that the orbit space is Hausdorff, and you could do the same thing. But for partial actions, this is not enough. Um, you actually need like to have only one size. Um, yeah, if you just have have uh, orbits of two different sizes, it, it can be non-Hausdorff. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's uh, that's it. <laughs> very much for the great talk. Do we have any questions in the audience? Go ahead. Please go ahead. Never mind. Uh, sorry, I was just confused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know this is a general thing for sister algebras that plays a role in the in the classification of sister algebras. Um, it's somehow yeah, I, 
someone want to take over? I'm not sure what the exact definition is or what the what the meaning is somehow. It's like the dimension of the sister algebra, right? Yeah, yeah it's a non-commutative uh, analog of the covering dimension of a topological space. So for C of X, the the decomposition rank is the dimension of X. Which, which brings me to, to my question, actually. So you, you used here the fact that the decomposition rank is, is finite, um, but in this reduction argument, I suspect your, your conclusion has to be that the nuclear dimension is finite, not the decomposition rank, because you, you're getting potentially, I mean, this is the difference. Finite decomposition rank implies stably finite, but that's not the case for, for nuclear dimension. So, so my, my, my question is, in this bootstrapping to get back to the general case from this reduction, Something has to to go wrong with the decomposition rank. It uh -huh. has to switch to nuclear dimension at some point. Uh -huh. Right. Um, if I remember correctly, then the so this um, so we have two different things here, right? We have the inductive limit as I sketched it. So we have to, the inductive limit where you exhaust your your the the domain of your action, and you have this like once you have uh, an action with finite, uh, only finite orbits, you can do like some extension stuff. And for the extension stuff, I think you need the decomposition rank. And I think at that at that point, you should still be stably finite because all the orbits are, are finite. Right. Um, um, that is because there's a big difference between an orbit, which is just one point, but it's global. Like it keeps returning to itself and an orbit which just stops. So that's like the, the magic of these partial actions that you can just cease to exist. Um, and then there's nothing and you, that's why you're finite dimensional. <laughs> so I was thinking what, I guess what makes the notion of a partial action non trivial is that there are cases when a partial action cannot be extended to the automorphism of the infinite space. Or there are cases when there are way too many such extensions and you cannot keep track of them somehow. So, um, well, I think, uh, but uh, what if we try to do this uh, very simple construction? Let's take the societal union of you and me and uh, construct an automorphism of it out of the data of data and data inverse. So, why can't we replace the notion of batch lightning by the notion of uh, global action? Ah, so so there is a notion of like globalizing partial actions, right? And but but this I think um, is not always. I think there always exists a globalization, but it might be on a non-Hausdorff space. So some th something goes wrong there. You can't just replace an. Um, you can't just replace the the partial action with the global action. Um, First of all, um, because I know I thought about this at some point, but it was a long time ago. I think something, I mean, if you just have an inclusion of these two algebras and you know that the big guy has finite nuclear dimension, can you automatically like conclude that uh, you can't, right? Like if you just have an inclusion of these two algebras and you know that the big guy is classifiable, you don't automatically know that the small guy is classifiable. And so just embedding everything into a global action somehow does not, uh, does not do it. You need to be an ideal or hereditary subalgebra or something like this. Um, so even if this globalization would always work, then uh, you you wouldn't. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? So I actually just, okay, Marzia. Yeah. Uh, so are you working to generalize the Karen Putnam and the uh, K Tauri theorems in this setting? Um, yeah, so that's, uh, thank you. That's something I wanted to say actually in the end, like some outlook. <laughs> so that's, I guess, the goal to figure out the range of the Elliott invariant. So I've been working a bit on groupoid models for these things because the Steely Putnam Strang paper uses groupoid models to compute the K theory of these orbit tracking guys. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, in the future. I hope that we'll be able to. Oh. 
That's a great question. I, I really don't know. Yeah, can you? I don't know. I mean, I'm the fact that they own the border, that they don't have to take the tickets. So, but yeah, I think that there should be a new thing that would be given to you. But I think it's. But oh, but oh, but wait now. <laughs> Just take a good though at it and compare it to the K period of one. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's just so it's not something that's different. So I just have a just a mini question. Uh, so when you're doing this and you're getting this, that you get matrix. Make it easier. Mm -hmm. Is that again because you have these? Because no they stop. Yeah, exactly. The no afterlife ones. Yeah, exactly. Because... I would sort of uh, like the, without my, my assumption would have been that they get who's out of it. Right? Yeah, exactly. I think that point was raised at the field seminar, and I got confused, and so now I, I was <laughs> I'm prepared. Uh, oh. So what happens maybe concretely if you have these? Um, Let's say you have this case that you just you vanish after m points, your action stops. If you take the product of m plus one sections, then this will always be zero. Because if you so say we take a point here, a function here, and we can like pull it through and we get on the other side, we get f composed with theta m plus one. But that thing is empty domain. So that's why you're finite dimensional. Because if you take products of Anything with more than m m sections, then you uh, so it's zero. There is no I I guess so. Any other questions? Not let's thank Karen. Yes. And next week we have uh, Vadim Lexi Forsyth gone to. Get this open. Uh, we'll talk about discrete subgroups of full groups of measure preserving equivalence relations. So, hope to see you there. <laughs>